for a New Testament canon? If he's talking about the Old Testament? Of course not. So when the, te the text of the New Testament themselves include references to extra canonical traditions, as Paul does, he says to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians, he says, keep the traditions that you heard from me, whether oral or written, when he tells Timothy. Okay, let's, uh, this, is, this is a really good one to, um, to talk about. And uh, um, so, well, let's see, that was 22 seconds. 22 seconds. Very, very good. But uh, I'm going to have to take him down so I can bring the uh, scriptures up here. Um, so this is a text that is so well known. And I, I will take the rest of our time to do this real quickly. Um, if you are a Reformed believer and you are going to engage in anything regarding Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, or anything else, I remember, I've told the story before, but we're reviewing stuff that we've said over coming up in 30 years now. Um, I remember the first time anyone ever asked me about this. It was, and I remember which direction I was facing. I was facing west. How do I know this? Because I was in the fellowship center at the North Phoenix Baptist Church prior to going out on outreach. Monday night outreach. Monday night outreach meal. Remember that? Um, you remember that, Rich? Did you ever, did you ever do that? You did. Okay. Um and someone sat down across from me, and they said they had run into a Roman Catholic uh, the week before on outreach, and they needed to know about this text. Now, I doubt that I gave them nearly as clear an explanation as I can now, um, because I hadn't been debating Roman Catholics for decades at that point in time. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, So then, brethren, stand firm, stekete, kai krataita, stand firm and hold fast to the paradasais, the traditions uh, which you were taught, whether dia lagu, through word, or di epistales, through epistle, written form, of us, from us. So, there is no, uh, you know, beforehand, well, that's, 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 let's not go beforehand, because that actually answers the question, but here is, here is the standard Roman Catholic, or in this case, Eastern Orthodox interpretation. Here you have extra canonical tradition that is to be authoritative in the life of Christians. Now, nowhere in Thessalonians are we told the content of this. All we're told is that the entire church at Thessalonica had received what is interpreted here as oral tradition. And so, uh, Jerry Mattatix, what he would like to do, he liked to bring this text out, and he would say the Protestants, you Protestants are only believing half of this command. This is a command. You are to hold firm. You're to stand fast, but you're to hold to two different kinds of traditions, and you're only holding to one. You're not holding to that which was uh, taught by word of mouth. You're only holding to that which was in the written form. So is that what Paul is doing here? The answer is no. No, by a long shot, let's look at the context of the verse. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren... Stand firm and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. So what are you to hold firm to? Well, if you look at those uh, verbs, stekete and krataita, in other passages in Paul, he's talking about the gospel message itself, which is what he's talking about here as well. They are to hold the gospel which had been delivered to the church at Thessalonica in two ways. Paul had preached there by word, and Paul had written to them, 1 Thessalonians. So they have the one gospel which has been delivered to them, paradosis, that's what the tradition is, in two different ways, through written word and through the preaching they had received from the Apostle Paul. This is not, this is not, does not contain anything that is not in the written word. This is the smuggled in belief that J. Dyer is presenting and that Roman Catholics try to believe. And so what they're saying is there is revelation 
There is something which is now. This is where they. This is where they'll stop. But this is what they have to say. If this is going to be relevant, they have to say it's not just the scriptures that are theonustos. They have to say that the traditions are theonustos because they're saying the traditions which are taught. So it's the traditions, one body, taught in two different ways. The Thessalonians, living in the apostolic age, had heard it taught to them by Paul, and they had received it in First Thessalonians. Many other churches that only receive the, the, the preached word, or many other churches would never have it preached to them by a living apostle, but would only receive it in the written word. But it's one body. What Rome has to do, and what anyone denying Sola Scriptura has to do, is to say there's stuff in here that is not in here. Okay? That's the assertion. That's what they can't prove. That's what they can't prove. So now you understand why I asked Mitch Pacwa in 1999, um, has Rome defined a single word that Jesus ever spoke that's not in Scripture? Infallibly. No. Anything the apostles ever... No. The problem is, when Rome says, well, we have the tradition of the church, and the tradition of the church is what, that which we draw from to define papal infallibility and the bodily assumption of Mary and the Immaculate Conception of Mary and, and perpetual virginity of Mary. So what you're saying is the apostles taught all that stuff to the church at Thessalonica, and it was passed down orally. Where's your evidence? There is none. And they know it. They know it. These are things that developed... In the case of the last dogmas defined by Rome, a thousand, more than a thousand years after the days of Jesus. There, there is no evidence that anyone ever believed that at all. It, it just, it's not the teaching of the church. So, make, so, so the idea, for, give me an example. Show me a single bishop at Nicaea that believed in the infallibility of the Bishop of Rome. There was none including the people that represented Bishop Rome. Uh, show me anyone there that believed that as a part of the gospel, you had to believe in the bodily assumption of Mary. Nothing. Zip, zero, nada. So you smuggle this little thing in, and then it can explode in this huge acorn of all the Mariology and all the... Uh, stuff about the papacy and the massive expansion of the sacramental system of Rome and all the rest of this stuff. And it's, it's all this little thing that you just smuggle through here and say, oh, there were these unwritten oral traditions, and yet all of them had been delivered to the church of Thessalonica. All of them had been. That's what this says. So if you're going to go there, what the passage is saying is that the Thessalonians knew the gospel. And they're to hold fast to it. That's all it's saying. And they had received it by apostolic preaching and by the written word. So hold firm to it. That's it. That's what the text is about. That's obviously what it's about. So when you expand that out and say, well, there's all this unwritten stuff that, yeah, we can't prove it for hundreds of years and stuff. And, you know, we don't have any evidence of it in that time period. But, you know, someone started teaching it centuries later, so, and we believe it now, so it must have been taught by the apostles. That's why you believe in Sola Scriptura. <laughs> and that's also why a lot of these guys are extremely hesitant to identify their quote-unquote oral traditions as theanustas. But if they're going to quote this text, they have to, because it's one body. And if this part of that, okay, let's say it's the one body. If this part's theanustas, what's this? Okay, so one body of divine revelation, it does not mean there's some secondary thing we can play with and we can define traditions out of a thousand years later or 1500 years later or wherever else it might be, whatever else it might be. Uh, that's why I emphasize recognizing that that one term, theanustas, is what defines a meaningful doctrine of Sola Scriptura. How, what do we possess today 
that we know came from the apostles of Jesus Christ. This is it. This is it. Nothing more. Nothing more. That does not then result in me and this under a tree. Because this book tells me that it's God's purpose to build his church. So it's not over there. It's not over there in the middle. And it is a balanced, uh, a balanced perspective. So, so yeah, I, uh, did I say I got uh, 20, 22 seconds there? That was good. That was, that was, that was a lot, but actually it, was a very important uh, aspect. You need to know 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Need to be prepared to give answer to it. You will hear it over and over again. Hold their feet to the fire. If they're going to claim that there are inspired oral traditions, then remind them the first time that anyone in the early church claimed that they had a tradition from the apostles. First time. Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus of Lyon, end of the second century. And it was his claim that Jesus lived to be more than 50 years of age. And I don't know any of the churches that deny Sola Scriptura that believe Jesus was more than 50 years old when he died. Isn't that interesting? If they don't believe that, then they must mean, they must believe that quote-unquote apostolic tradition that was not found in written form is not necessarily reliable. Which, of course, would be very, very true.